you know, I, I really was naive. I thought, you know, again, if I do all my chores on time or, or maybe when she chokes me, she'll see that I'm dying and my mommy would magically wake up from her, 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 her coma. And one time I got this letter from my teacher and he said, you're not in trouble, David. This is a good letter. Your mom's going to love it. And my mom read it saying, oh, we like David in our classroom. He's a good student. He named the school paper. We like David. And my mom, she's like right by bending down my ear. And she says, aren't you precious? Aren't you special? And that's when she said, I wish for it to die. Warm, warm welcome, David Pelser. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show, Alexander. Yeah, I'm really, really glad that you're here. And I, I must say that uh, I've done like, you know, 750 episodes. But this, this episode is very important for me. And uh, it's meaning, it's, it's had a deep meaning to, to meet you because I have, I have read your book for many, many years ago. Uh, I shall call it. And uh, when I read that, and also I read it today, and I read it many, many, many times after that, and I like, I'm, I'm crying against it. So um, I'm, I'm very glad that you're here, and we're not, very, I'm very glad to meet you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I know you're very busy too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but I, I want to ask you that um, because I, I know that when, you, when you launched the book, the first book, I think you have dropped nine launched nine books now the nine nine books yes sir nine. and the uh, man of them is the like the best best sellers and um uh, but how did your what was the response because when i when i first read your book i heard so many people talk about it so i was wondering that guy who had so much problem i had a a, a terrible childhood when he came out with that story, I was wondering what happened. Ninety five. <laughs> well, the the book was printed before it was published. It was printed in nineteen ninety three, and uh, I, I thought it was published, but it wasn't because it's, it's the publishing business is is kind of quirky. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like the Hollywood business. You think you're with an agent doing a film, you're going, oh my god, you're not even a waiter on the set. Um, the book was published in 95 and it, it kind of languished in a sense. I mean, it wasn't an instant hit. I was doing a lot of traveling across America, doing in-service training, making several appearances a day. So that kind of gave it some momentum. And uh, we were lucky to do a national talk show with a gentleman named Montel Williams in 1997 so when you think about the book, when it first came out in 93, it took four years for that momentum to kind of just kick in. And once it did, we were kind of off to the races. Because as you know, that first book was on the New York Times bestseller list for, for over six years. <laughs> That's crazy. And it, it is. I mean, thinking about it now, when you're in a race, you're just thinking about your next stride, your next step. And now that I've had time to kind of process this, but the average stay on the New York Times is like three to four weeks. Six years is just insane. That's crazy. And 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 it eventually became the number one book in the world. And uh, yes. and and I I I cannot. I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's just a lot of there's a lot of luck, and I I think part of the luck is it resonated with the audience because it was not a story about abuse. It's a story about you know my my childhood and just being resilient. And, and I think that's why it did well, particularly in this day and age, because we're living in post COVID world and there's a lot of stresses in every country. And as you know, I was a fire captain uh, for two separate fire districts in my state. So I was going up and down, back and forth, trying to help people out. And that's the one thing I think COVID taught us was, you know, to be humble, that we're all somehow connected and that we can all band together to help each other out. And now every day that we don't have COVID is great. Every day mm -hmm. we don't have a school cheating. We should be humble in a sense because it is, you know, for good or ill, because I do a little podcast show, not as big as yours, but I try to tell people this is now the new normal. 
Mm -hmm. know, we have to adjust as best we can. You can't go back in a time machine. There is no butterfly effect. You do what you have to do for the moment. And that's there. That's how it is. And that's what I did. Uh, I, I get interviewed quite a bit and, and some companies like to interview me and it's like, Dave, what is your keys to success? <laughs> I'm going, well, you just keep walking one day, mm -hmm. one step at a time. You know, you, I'm, I'm, I'm a little tenacious. If anything, mm -hmm. being smacked around as a kid was a good training about resilience and, and not giving up on myself. And a lot of people who have not been challenged and, and they get challenged in their thirties or forties and they don't know, they have no base, nothing to build upon. And I always go back to that. Well, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm a very, very lucky person because it could have turned out very bad for me. Yeah. Nice wondering many times. And always, it wasn't when I read the book today, again, it's wondering. Yeah. And, and a lot of that stuff that you have, you have been into, I I've been into some of that stuff. I would not compare your shadow to mine. Uh, also, I know that it's it's very much you can't compare any shadow to another one, but your is um, very extreme, very 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 extreme. Uh, yeah. But but I I know that I I see a lot of stuff that's going on, and I think that many people who have a complicated childhood uh, have maybe not extreme as you have, maybe some have worse. But they have the same thing that they felt worthless. They are, it, it's their own fault. And uh, uh, also they have something that when you were at the bathroom and, and your mother was like pushing you down uh, and uh, when you did, didn't get food, you get punished. You had to eat your, your, uh, your brother's poo. Uh, like uh, you must have something that say that I don't, I will not fucking go up, go up right now. And I need to take care of my own business. I need to take care of this by myself because I can't, you can't trust, even though your mother and father that is, you know, will, will be the love of your life. And, and it's, it's, it's a different dynamic because bullies were bullied before and child abuse is, is basically a learned behavior. And my mother was raised in an era that she was psychologically abused, if not physically abused. And she lived in part of a country, or part of America, uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah, which did not favor women back in that time. She was raised to keep her mouth shut, get married, have a happy life, and just forget about it. Well, you know, cancer just doesn't always go away. It's always dormant and it's always in the background, ready to get you in a sense. And for whatever reason, she just happened to select me. But if you look at a child called it from the psychological position, everything that happened bad against me was actually good timing in a sense, because at age eight, you know, we'll become self-aware that we're part of a family dynamic, that we're part of the world. And where do we fit into the world? And what are we going to start thinking about doing as a young child? And when I was uh, burned on, on that gas stove that you read about, I had to decide in the basement, hey, I've got to do something. I can no longer be in denial. The situation is only going to get worse. And I've got to rely on myself because children are very black and white. You can put them in a room and they might cry for a while or look for a way out. But after like five, 10 minutes, they'll make a fort. They'll, 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 they'll take a nap. Kind of like... There was a movie with Tom Hanks many years ago called Big. He's a small child in an adult body. And his first night in New York City, he, he's all scared because there's gunshots and loud noises. <laughs> and a few days later, he just he just turns up the TV, you know, because he has to, he adjusts mm. to it in a sense. And children by nature are pretty resilient. And everything that happened against me at that time, again, happened at a right time for me to kind of think differently and then when i was placed in a foster care god bless i mean i saw kids that had no problems but they brought a lot of problems to the table hmm. and they didn't they would talk toughy tough but i knew on the inside oh my god this 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 guy's not gonna make it it's like being in the military you can tell within a, a two or three hours who's got it and who doesn't who's yeah. talking trash and who's got that inter inter 
power in a sense. And again, I did was just grind it out. You know, I figured if I can survive being smacked around, then maybe I can try to do this or try to do that. And I've I've been very blessed. I mean, I've had an, an I've had an amazing, adventurous military career, and then I got to travel uh, uh, the the world, the world. You know, doing in service training mm. or doing comedy shows in Iraq during the summertime, or you know, when I was fifty two, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I decided I want to be a firefighter like my father <laughs> at fifty two. Holy 52. cow! And I took all the hardcore courses, man. I took everything I can get my hands on. But I always tell young people, and this is a good thing to remember. I say, live a grand adventure to tell a good story. And I've been mm -hmm. very blessed. And what makes me upset is when I run into people and they say, oh, Dave, like I, there was this guy, I was doing a book signing. His name was Joe, and you can tell he's very hyper, hyper, hyper. He wanted to be the center of attention. Mm -hmm. And when I did the Q&A, he was he's like, Dave, 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 I want you to know that I was abused too. And the audience is like, oh, poor Joe, poor Joe. All right, Joe, what's your story? Well, my father yelled at me once for 10 seconds. <laughs> what? And he's been yeah. dead for 30 years, but he's still in my head yelling at me. I'm going, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's you know this as a young man, and I know this as a seasoned citizen. When you survive cancer, you never say you're a victim of cancer. You say, I'm a survivor of cancer. I right. fight cancer, right. and I am blessed. I am blessed that you know I'm in mm. remission, or I've got an extra year to live my life. Mm. And what kills me is when I come upon people who are traumatized from their childhood, they allow it for good yeah. or ill. To, con to just totally just yeah. take control. Yeah, stay, st st always, st still in the Yale. Yeah, I, I try to be happy as much as I can. Every time I take a bite of, of something to eat, I'm so happy. And my biggest thing is, and this is a question everybody likes to ask, what's your favorite thing, Dave? Here it is, clean sheets. Clean mm. sheets. I love the mm. smell of clean sheets and how they feel because, you know, I lived in the basement with a crappy army cot. I slept with rags all over my body, and now I have the opportunity to have clean sheets. I didn't speak for about 14 years because my mother did not allow me to speak, and because I also swallowed ammonia twice in 24 hours. That's why my I talk either fast or slow. And now they say, he didn't speak for 14 years. We can't shut him up, for goodness <laughs> sake. When they said, oh, you might be on the show for an hour or a little bit longer, I'm going, that's it. It, that's all we can do this all day baby so it's a, it's what i'm really trying to convey is you have to look at the situation for what it was yeah and not what you think it still is and that mm -hmm. is a choice you're on the front part of the ship and it's sailing away and you're waving mm -hmm. goodbye 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 right. well still sooner or later you're going to have to go to another part of the ship you have to keep moving forward mm -hmm. and you deserve to be happy mm -hmm. if your audience gets nothing out of this be happy, be happy now, be happy now, damn it. Survive <laughs> for a reason. Right, right, right. Right. Uh, that's very important. And I, you... I, I choose not to be miserable, is what I'm trying to say. Mm. You talked about uh, for the audience that not know that. Can you can you tell us the story about uh, the gas the gas stove? Oh, the gas stove, I was eight years old and my mother read something in a newspaper which means it was premeditated and she basically said you've made my life living hell i'm going to show you what hell is all about and she took my arm and she held it over the gas stove for a few seconds and it was uh it was pretty bad and what happened is she wanted me to lay down on the gas stove my two brothers at the time were at their little boy scout meeting and my father was at work so i was home alone with my mom and I was so scared about burning on the gas stove. For the first time, I decided to, to think ahead and trick her. So I had her hit me rather than burn me until my brother came home early. And she threw me down the stairs. And for the first time, Alexander, I cried. I let it all out. I call this purging. Mm. It's like psychological you vomit. And I said, I'm trying to be a good boy. I'm trying to do all the chores on time. 
I don't know what's wrong, but I can't change you. So I got to change my thinking. And I had these blisters on the palm of my hand all the way down to my bicep. And I raised my arm and I basically said, from this moment on, I'm not going to quit. From this moment on, I'm going to give everything my best shot. And that changed the whole equation. There's a thing in America in psychology classes is called the Clark Kent effect. Clark Kent, you know, is from small town, Smallville, USA. Clark Kent is kind of a geeky guy. He doesn't fit in. He's not cool. He's, he's just awkward as hell. But on the inside where no one can see, he comes from another planet. He's faster than a speeding bullet. He can fly through the air. So it's kind of like that effect. How you deal with things on the inside is how you project yourself on the outside. Mm-hmm. In my country and in your country, we love you know the Marvel comics. We love Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman and all those characters. They have a different life on the outside, but on the inside, that's where they draw their superpowers from. So as a kid, I was able to kind of stand up for myself psychologically. I, I knew things would get worse, but now I have to think ahead. And that's all you have to do. It's one day at a time, one problem at a time. And a lot of people in my country says, oh, you're the child abuse guy. He says, no, I'm the Americana guy. I'm not self-made. I had a lot of help. But it's, 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 to me, it was always a good story to live about. I didn't talk and I speak a few languages. I do comedy. I had no coordination yet. I flew for the United States Air Force at age 52. I'm going to try to be a good firefighter and continue to serve my community. So it's all these decisions. The life I'm living now at age 62 is the life I created over 50 years ago. So it's almost like investing. You invest in monies or stocks or you invest in time into the relationship, time into your family, your health. And now it's kind of paid off. When did you, um, when, when you look back, uh now for this like like how how much is it? it's like 58 years when you was four or five years 58 years ago uh what was the first sign that this will not be a normal childhood i you know looking at it when you're a kid you know you're, you're very you're thinking about kid stuff your attention span is like five seconds you know and i just remember i knew something was wrong about age four and that's when we get memories in the the first four years of your life you know very maternal years the trust years the bonding years and Mm -hmm. i always knew i was very scared of my mother my two brothers were scared of my mom we knew that she acted very differently when my father was home she was all dressed up and then when she wasn't she'd be on the phone and her her mother would just call constantly and just yell and scream and you're stupid why did you get married? You have too many kids. You're doing everything wrong, Irva. And so my mom would just take it and take it. Hmm. And then she started drinking earlier and earlier. So you can kind of see the demise. So we all knew something was different. But I know um, there was an incident. It was a child called it. Um, she was drunk one Sunday afternoon. My father's at work. And uh, the three of us were playing loudly. And I guess she came stomping down the hall. My brothers whizzed right by her and she grabbed my arm. And because she was drunk, she lost her balance. Mm. And she, by accident, by accident, she pulled my arm right out of the socket. The thing is, the next morning, she wakes up crying. Oh my gosh, you don't know this. You forgot, but you fell out of the bunk bed last night. I tried to catch you father's home i'm going to take you to the hospital i'm like that didn't happen but i didn't say a thing because mommies don't lie i must be a bad child i deserved it mm-hmm. we go to the doctor's office he puts my arm back in says this the more dramatic story oh i was screaming and crying i tried to get there in time and the doctor's looking at me like this is odd this does not make sense When I got home, she told my father, a firefighter with some medical training. And now the story is, I heard little David screaming and yelling. I got out of bed. 
I put on my robe, I opened the door, I walked down the hallway, I opened the door, and he fell right through my fingers. Hmm. Now, does that make sense to anybody? He, my father, by coincidence, he uh, uh, back in my day, as a treat, you know, you, you got a dime or a nickel if you were a good kid. And I think he was going to give me a, a nickel. Before he gave me the nickel, he dropped it. It fell very fast, didn't it? So this was mm -hmm. a plausible, this was a very thin-veiled lie. But I didn't say anything. The doctor didn't say anything. My brothers didn't say anything. My father. So you can see how this starts to boil. It simmers. It simmers before it boils over. So I have to answer your question. I, I, I knew something was wrong at age four. I also knew when I was in kindergarten that mm -hmm. I didn't speak. So I didn't have pronunciation, no phonics. I was always in the corner alone. If someone got near me, I'd flinch. Mm -hmm. And this was, ab I mean, to me, it was normal behavior. But mm -hmm. my point being is my teachers saw this. Mm -hmm. But because my mother was, uh, she, 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 she could spin a good story, a good yarn, as we say. Mm -hmm. And she was ahead of the PTA and, you know, everybody adored my mother. She was so grandiose. So they couldn't figure out what was wrong, but everybody knew about the secret. And um, do you remember when she hit you the first time? Not the first time, no. It, it, was, it was just normal behavior by the time I was four. Yeah. Okay. So um, I also one of one of the punishments you 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 got was you you were like facing the mirror. I had mm -hmm. a yes. quite same, but I had a freezer, so I should say like I, I was standing hours in front with my nose into the freezer and standing there. It was one of the thing I had, but you had yeah, a... the, the, the the mirror to me looking at it now is more psychological because. I had to yell at myself, I'm a bad boy, I'm a bad boy. And that's mm -hmm. programming. And it was really sad because the, 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 new, the new book that you got, Return to the River, there's a scene in which I'm in the bottom of the basement. My parents have separated. My grandmother on my mama's side comes in unannounced, and they have a big squall, big fight. And then the door to the basement just, just flings open. She turns on the light. And I'm wincing because I'm at the bottom of the stairs sitting on top of my hands. And it's very cold and very painful. And my mother said something that just I'll never forget. She looks over at her mother and says, there it is. Are you satisfied now? There it is. Because mm -hmm. she wouldn't call me David. She'd call me it. My grandmother says, she leans over and she says, that's the sorriest child I have ever seen. Mother replies, that's what you used to say about me. So you can see mm -hmm. how all of this connects. And mm -hmm. it took me many years. Uh, even when I was a young man in my 20s to finally look in the mirror and look at myself and not feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because I was a young man, I was shaving and so forth. And I was very awkward, very shy, of course. But that that was very sinister, very psychological. And I think, too, both my mother and grandmother got some sense of satisfaction because it's really about revenge and control, you know, over a human, over, over a human being. And particularly with, with kids, I mean, they don't know. They don't understand what's going on. Okay. So I actually thought there was one kid in every family that was a bad child. And then I thought, no, there's one kid in every city that's a horrible child. I happen to be it. Or there's one kid on the planet that's a horrible kid. I happen to be it, per se. So there's a lot of programming involved. It's not the, the physical abuse. It's more of the psychological torture and how you kind of, you're programmed to torture yourself because you have a lack of worth. And, and it, it's, 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 it's taken a long time for me to be where I'm at today. Because again, I'm 62. I've slowed down a little bit. I'm confident on what I can do and not do. And I'm just trying to, you know, if I can help out, I'll help. You know, if not, mm. I'm just kind of doing my own thing. But, but how do you think that affects people? If, if we talk about uh, bad relationship, 
uh, that people are uh, that you that you say something to to other people and so they um, don't feel good about themselves or childhood like that. You have to say oh, what you're saying. It was you 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 was looking in the mirror and said that you are a bad boy. A bad boy. I am a yes. bad boy. I am a bad boy. I am a bad For boy. Hours. For hours and hours For and hours, hours and hours. How and I had think... I wasn't allowed to close my eyes because that was a big thing because I would just like try to whisper it and she'd come in, you know, maybe smack me around. And I had to look at myself, which is, you know, and, and it's like I said, I, it, I was I was programmed. But I knew as things spun more out of control that I didn't say this. I didn't do that. There's something wrong here. Mm. So I had to, I had to be self-aware. My mind, even to this day, is very, very fast to solve problems. I try to do math or little, little things to keep me, you know, in, in, engaged. But for a kid to survive, it's like a child being in a war zone. It's a different mentality, and I just, I had to learn to grow up mentally a little bit quicker than a lot of the other kids. And I saw that again when I was in foster care. You know, these, these. Kids, teenagers were doing teenage things, and I decided to work, you know, 20, 40 hours a week in junior high school. And then I got into high school, I decided to work 40 plus hours a week, always thinking ahead about survive, survive, survive. And now that I'm at this age, I can kind of just coast a little bit. I'm okay with myself, the inside and the outside. Uh, a beautiful lady, you must have heard of her, Miss Oprah Winfrey, mm. when she turned 40. She says, my inside matches with my outside. I feel good about myself, my body, my spirituality, mm -hmm. and it's starting to match. And I started to match maybe the last four or five years that I'm okay with myself. I can look in the mirror. I'm not a bad person. I, I pride myself on being a very good person, but it's my decision. Every day, it's my decision, what mm -hmm. I do and don't do, and how happy or how miserable I wish to be. It is a choice. And people sometimes forget that. Again, they're looking at their past and, and not letting it go or getting the help they need. If your car is broken and you can't fix it, you take it to the mechanic. If you're sick and you're not getting better, you go to a doctor. The same thing with mental health. And to kind of spin this again, because of COVID, at least in my country, we were seeing so much stress, people doing horrible things. Uh, one mm -hmm. of our cities in the Bay Area, Oakland, is like a war zone, you know, and part of that is the stress of COVID, in a sense. All the little things that add up. I heard that San bomb. Francisco is terrible right now. Oakland is worse than San Francisco. It is, and, and I'm from the Bay Area. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I know San Francisco back of my hand. But uh, it's 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 Oakland is worse. Yeah, yeah. They have they they're they're losing businesses left and right because there's a lack of uh, a lot of police officers have moved on to other cities. So there's not a lot of law enforcement there. Uh, uh, they they have people coming in in droves, you know, to 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 to, to rip people off, even in front of the stores. The stores, I think, we're losing uh, a bus at least two or three businesses a day in Oakland. They just mm -hmm. shut down. They're tired of it, tired of it. One gentleman was uh, robbed six times in five weeks. Six five times. in five weeks. Oh, it's Jesus. just terrible. So, and, 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 and it's almost, you know, people are just frustrated. And when they get frustrated, they might get scared. And one thing goes to the other. As a fire captain, I was concerned that in my country, we would have had what I call a Mad Max situation. I mean, because uh, uh, what if someone decides to to steal a, a, a fuel truck or steal a truck laden with food and then things just snowballed? You, know, you saw something on our country that I'm very embarrassed about. Uh, some, some folks in Michigan were going to kidnap and torture the governor. Because they didn't like uh, 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 them being told what to do. They thought COVID was all fake and you're not the boss of us and I'm an adult. And it's like, hey, COVID is real. We need to just settle down and, you know, self-contain ourselves for a while. You know, so a lot of people, you see them react 
to things. And maybe they have triggers from their past. I don't know. That's why I'm always trying to be calm, cool, and collected. And maybe learning that as a child has given me that situation where I used to fly for the Air Force, and sometimes we have in-flight emergencies. And I would see people freak out. As a firefighter, I see kids or young adults, either they just freeze or they, they get more amped up than they should be. It's like the first time you're a parent and your kid comes over and he's got blood on his hands. And, and he's freaking out. You've got to be calm, cool, and collected. Even if it's a bad mm -hmm. cut, hey, it's okay. We've got this. So, again, it's about adjustments. And I had to learn to adjust as a very young boy. Mm -hmm. And um, something also when I'm reading your books, you you are, you are talking about that you were, were ostracized. Is that the right word? Ostracized from the family. Ostracized. Ostracized. Ostracized yes. from the. You yes. were also yes, ostracized sir. from the family. You never eat yes. dinner with them. Um, they was like left you when they was going on vacations. Uh, left you to your aunts. Uh, and uh, they, they, they was going at McDonald's and you were sitting in the car alone. It was many situations. Well, that and what it was at first, it's called um, target child selection in which the, 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 the perpetrator will select one child at random. It's almost like, you know, you and I are at a dance and, and I see this beautiful girl and I'd, out of all the girls, I ask her for a dance. It's very innocent. But once that starts to form, it's a different type of dynamic relationship. So my mother could have selected my two other brothers. She happened to select me. And my brothers were stupefied, like, why are you always beating up on David? My mother's response was, he's not good. And if you're not good, I'm going to discipline you too. Mm -hmm. And after a while, it's almost like, Dave, I'm sorry, but better you getting smacked around than me. And then mm -hmm. you also saw... And uh, the child called it, and then in return to the river, how one of my brothers started to bully me, in a sense, because yeah, again, yeah. it's a learned, it's a learned behavior. You know, my mother would say, "Oh, uh, uh, David is the reason why your father and I are not getting along. David's the reason why we're going to separate." And after a while, you start to believe the lie. It's very obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very obvious. So I can understand all the dynamics. My father was a very gentle person, very quiet person. And he was raised that the men, they bring home, they work, they bring home the money. Uh, uh, your job is to take out the trash as a guy and paint, paint the house once in a while. So it was basically my mother's house. And she ran the house in her way. My father was gone quite a bit. So he would get a briefing as soon as he came home. How's it going? What's going on? What has David done now? Why is he in the bottom of the basement? Oh, uh, he did this. He did that. But it got to the point that my father was very broken. There's a thing um, in, 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 in one of the books, which is uh, um, my mother, my father is home. He's still in his duty clothes and I'm pressing up against him. My mother gets a teaspoon of, of pneumonia. And this will now be the second time I've swallowed ammonia in 24 hours. And she jams it down my throat. I just fall to the floor and I can't breathe. My father is standing over me and I'll never forget this. He's very tired and he says, what has the boy done wrong this time? Mother instantly replies, the boy is always trying to steal food. My father replies, well, maybe if you fed the boy, he wouldn't steal so much. And again, he's a firefighter. He's just standing there. But by that time, my mother had that, what I call uh, anaconda, uh, a snake that, that, that squeezes you so hard. I was trapped. My father was trapped. My brothers were trapped. Everybody was trapped. They all knew what was going on. But, you know, it, 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 again, it was a situation better you than me. And yeah, I think that's so crazy, you know, because the first time she was lying to your father when you uh, fell off the bank bed and, or when, when you fell off yeah. the bank bed. Yeah. And, and again, I, 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 I do that. Take take a coin and drop it. 
It doesn't, I mean, my mom took 60 seconds or two minutes to jump out of the bed and I somehow slide past her fingers. That is so obvious. But again, no one said anything. I didn't say anything. It's weird because I, I, I could have ran away a thousand times, but I had nowhere to go. You know, and I thought, well, at least I have a bunk bed. At least I can scrounge through the garbage can to try to get food. So there's, again, a lot of moving dynamics in, 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 in this. It's, it's not a linear thing. How can you manipulate people? Because you and I, uh, I feel like I can talk for myself, but I think you are the same. It, it, it would be nothing that can do that I will be in that kind of situation. I will not let my kid, uh, if somebody would do that against my kid, I will be, you know, crazy. And uh, if somebody try to do it slow by slow, I would like, no, 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 what the fuck are you doing? Come on. It will not get that far that they are pushing, that they are putting ammoniac in the mouth and they say like, okay, what happened? Okay, it's okay. And he was a firefighter. That's, and I cannot, I cannot understand that thing it's 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 because in my father's case he's again a very gentle person by the time he realized this thing was insane it was we were way past that point years and years ago you know and part of it's like you know i'd rather just sit down and shut up because i don't want this remember the, the scene and you know, when i was stabbed i was about nine years old and i and i i i, I was still d required to do the chore the dishes and I heard my father in the next room, and I thought, oh, my gosh, dad, father has always said one of these days, I'm going to talk to her. One of these days, I'm going to step up one of these days. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is the day. And I remember I kind of made my way into the, the living room, and my father can hear me, and he's hiding behind his paper. I'm like three feet away from him, and my wound is dripping on the carpet you can hear it drop 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 it's a pool of blood and i started to stutter mm. that my mother have stabbed me and i thought okay this stabbed you with a knife the knife which was an accident you know and and she was a nurse before she married dad so she knew how to give me a good tourniquet and i thought this is the moment that my dad's going to throw down the paper and he's going to fly down the hallway knock my mother out and we're going to go to never never land this is the exact moment and I'll never forget, he said something effective, uh, uh, we don't need any more hell here tonight. I won't even tell mother you told me. No, go get away. Go back and do your dishes. I'm like, okay, I've been waiting for years. And as an adult, now I'm thinking, you know, it doesn't take years to step in. And this that was the prime moment. But unfortunately, that's, that, that's when I lost my dad, in a sense. When he admitted to me, I'm not going to do a damn thing about this. And that's because I think he was so broken because you have to look at this differently too. Uh, before mother and father or mother and father, they were dating. They were lovers. They were young. He came back from World War II, the, the day of wine and roses era, you know, and, and, and this is his love. This is his wife. This is his lover. That's become a monster. And that's his wife. I mean, I cannot imagine. It's almost like someone knocking on the door saying, hey, we arrested Alexander for, for abusing children, and he's a, he's a child rapist. The first thing the wife's going to say is, oh, no, you got the wrong guy. Alex would never do that. But you kind of know in the back of your head, hmm, there's something there. I mean, we always are in denial. When 9-11 happened, I, I thought, oh, it's just an accident. And then two, then four planes. I'm going, holy shit, because we all do this, whether it's the divorce or a medical situation. Mm. First, we're in denial. And then there's anger. And then we want to bargain. And then we get depressed. And finally, we have to say, I have to accept this divorce. I have to accept the fact that I'm going to do a lot of chemo. I have to accept the fact that I'm getting old, blah, blah, blah. As a child, I had to accept my fate. After maybe, like I said, uh, at age eight, that's when the dynamic changed. But what I'm trying to convey is there were so many, everybody thinks, oh, if one person's abuse, it's, it's only the kid. My mm -hmm. brothers saw abuse. They felt the fear. They were afraid of my mom. My father was a great firefighter, but at home he was just broken. Mm -hmm. My neighbors saw me, the kids at school. 
I smelled so bad. I'm so ashamed. They, sometimes they would throw up because I smelled so horrible. And again, I was stealing their food. And I felt so bad about that. My teacher, there was a movie called Schindler's List. Mm. And at the end of the film, he says, I, I could have, I, if, I, if I gave them my watch or gave them my ring, I could have rescued 10 more people. My teachers, when I met them uh, uh, as an adult, they, they, they were so, oh, Dave, I should have stepped in earlier. I could have stopped this. I could have kidnapped you. I could have fed you. I mean, the dynamic, again, again, like a virus, it spreads everywhere. So it's it's really sad that this experience happened. But at the same time, now that I'm older, you know, I've I've done a lot of work on abuse and prevention and and always trying to be of a goodwill person. And I don't try to limit myself with just the dynamic of abuse, but about choices and how to deal with your life and how to make your life more fulfilled. Uh, in my country, I have, to, I have to say this carefully. I'm trying to be a gentleman here. We have what I call clowns. I call them ass clowns. They, they think, oh, if you can think it, you've done it. I'm a master motivational speaker. I'm going, you guys are full of crap. Okay. <laughs> have you ever walked an old lady across the street? Because I didn't see you a Katrina. And I didn't see you handing out food to my COVID victims. So what I'm trying to convey is there was a lot of tomfoolery, as we call it in America, where there's people that really step up and try to do something for other people. Mm -hmm. And I've been fortunate that my teachers stepped in. I was very fortunate to have uh, uh, great social workers and good foster parents and even people in the neighborhood who would accept me for all my clunkiness. I, I was fortunate that the right time, the right place, all these different elements, they, they like, like, like a cipher lock, everything connected to the key to unlock, you know, maybe my potential. I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. But I also think, too, you know, you have to make your luck. You have to do something with your luck. Don't, a lot of people, they, they, they think, okay, once I get married or have the kid or once I get all this money or once I'm all the fame, then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. I'm going, no, you kind of have to make your luck every single day. And I'm just grateful. I was uh, 14 and I was in foster care for about a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. And this one doctor said that he examined me as a psychiatrist. He says, he tells her it's not going to make it. The abuse is too extensive. He can't even walk or talk or barely go to the bathroom and he's 14 and the doctor predicted that i would be dead or in jail by the time i was like uh 20 and i just thought to myself again if i can survive all that shit i did as a kid i can try and that's why i think i did well the air force obviously didn't want a high school dropout foster kid because in my day they thought if you're a foster kid you must have murdered somebody you know you must have blown up yeah. a building you're a terrible terrible person and it took me six months, every single day, five days a week, six days a week, going to the recruiter's office so I can wiggle myself in there. And then eventually I got the worst job in the world. It's called Swamp Cook, like the movie Papillon. I'm in the swamps of Florida cooking from <laughs> three morning to nine. And I eventually got out of the swamps and took college classes and eventually, you know, was allowed to fly for the Air Force. It's, it's like the book. The book took four years four years from the time it was printed to make it to the level that it did well in your country and it did well in, in other countries. And again, uh, if I'm known for something, it's, it's I'm the smartest idiot you'll ever meet, but I'm very <laughs> tenacious. I'm very, it's like on the, the Terminator film, I'll be back. Uh, yeah. you know, it's like, it's like COVID. COVID will never quit. COVID will always be back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering, um, uh, I, I, I've also been, I've been in the Swedish Navy, uh, like, uh, that's why I have this, uh, do you see this, uh, this is, a uh, a frog. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like the, it's like the Navy SEAL, but, but in Sweden. So it's called, uh, uh mine, <laughs> mine, mine clearance diver. So it's like four or 500 people who, who are trying to be it every year. And, uh, they are just, and, and maybe 20 start, uh, start, uh, education and 10, uh, yeah, we made it. So I well, good I, for you. Yeah, it's, it's like and, and, and I think and, that... and think think about that though. Okay, that is a very rare position, 
And and I remember like when I went to jump school, paramilitary school, there was like maybe over a thousand kids, a thousand kids. And I think we graduated less than 200. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of tell again who's got it, who doesn't. There was this guy, a friend of mine, he was in the squadron with me, and his name was Bill Arnold. And he was kind of like you, tall, good-looking man, and everything he did was perfect. I'd go to the gym with him. He'd work out big muscles. He had this smile. The girls went crazy over Bill. And I was just his geeky friend. So the first day of, 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 of jump school, the paramilitary parachute course, the, 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 the sergeant's walking down the line. And he's like, oh, you, you're pretty boy. Da, 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 da. Give me a kiss. Hey, Pelzer, Schmelzer, you skinny fool. All right, freak. You guys are terrible. Now get your ass in gear. Go. And I was, we were getting our stuff together. <laughs> and I was on my knees getting my stuff together. I looked up and Bill's crying. I said, dude, there's no crying in baseball. There's no crying. We got to get our shit together and go. But I realized because he DOR'd, he dropped on request. He didn't graduate. Bill had never been challenged before. Mm. Never. Because you were challenged as a young person, because I was challenged as a young person. You know, it gives you a well to draw from. And it doesn't, when I used to teach, because uh, I have the rank of chief with the Air Force, and I used to go to bases and teach different things. I would tell my uh, paramilitary guys and girls, I said, don't think about this course. And one course in the Air Force is over three years, nonstop training, three years just to make it to that level. I said, think not even one day at a time. Think breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. Something that's close enough that you can attain. You're still going to mm. crawl for it. Mm. But think in smaller chunks. In my country, we got people that are 5,000 pounds. And they're so grossly overweight. But they think if they have three easy payments of 1995, they're going to be cute and sexy in a matter of a day or two. They want it so fast. I always say, if you're working out, do two extra push-ups. Uh, mm. uh, uh, if, uh, if, if you have five minutes, do a, do a math question. Spend an mm. extra five seconds. Read to your kids, for goodness sakes. Take time for yourself to go outside, have a glass of wine, have a cup of coffee, and just uh, relax. It's always the small things that are consistent that makes a difference. I think a lot of people in my country, they want to be the number one of whatever, the sexiest girl alive, or the richest person on the planet. I want this. I want that. I said, no. American it's dream. One, yeah, it's, it's, it's one in a trillion. And even if you are number one, it's only going to be for a short time. Right. But what if you gave everything your best shot? Everything from cooking to walking to talking to all that you are and all that you can do for others. Just Give it your best because a lot of my people are very lazy. You know, that's why they didn't want to go back to work from COVID. They thought, hey, I'm getting a paycheck. This is awesome. <laughs> I'm going, well, and then they get pissed off because the checks aren't coming. I'm going, you should be grateful that you had a check, okay, because you should be self-contained. The, the reason you succeeded is you drew from that well. It was never about obtaining this one great thing, but it's what you can do with something else mm. that leads you to some other place. Like mm. this podcast show will probably take you to another dimension here in a few years. You know, you'll be the guy that, oh, I like Alexander. He's calm. He's got good information. It's like me. I have a little podcast show and it's slowly building. I don't need a million listeners. I just need people who, you know what, if I can get five new listeners a day mm -hmm. and they can use that information and help them out, they in turn can help out other people. It's about mm -hmm. being of service like that your medallion is. It's about being of service. Mm -hmm. I believe people in special forces are more about saving lives than taking lives. There's mm -hmm. a big difference. Mm -hmm. What would you say to your eight-year-old self? If it was right now, if I was like... Uh, uh, 62 keep, keep and you going. meet yourself right now. Keep, keep like going. Eight, ten you're you're going to make it. You're going to make it. I, I, I really wish, because I, I work a lot with um, uh, kids in juvenile halls and situations in foster care, and I tell them the truth. I said, if I could take my 
brain and put it in your body. My heart, as old as it is, and put it in your body. With what I know, as strong as I am on the inside, I would kick ass. So it's just keep going. Life is not easy. You want to have better days than bad days, and that's choice. And sometimes, pardon me, you get overwhelmed in your situations, but you just knock it out one box at a time. You know, it's like being a firefighter. You have clothes, and then you have uh, turnout jackets, turnout pants, boots. You throw mm. on a self-contained breathing apparatus. You grab a tool. You grab another tool. You got a radio, and you've got all this stuff, but you do it smallly. You know, just like three to five seconds at a time. Like when I deal with people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, they teach me more about life than I teach them. And it's one day at a time. And sometimes it's one hour at a time. Again, mm -hmm. breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. uh, something I want to jump into is something that had put me in a jail. Uh, for a while, you know, overcome the childhood and also like people, but I would say more for me is that uh, if people are doing bad stuff to you when you're also are an adult. Uh, so uh, how did you handle the hate? How do you handle the frustration? I know that you was like hating your mother and she was like saying to you that uh, in, the, in the one of the worst situation that I want you to be killed. I, I hate you. Yeah. I hate yeah. you. And, and, it felt, that, that, and, that was... and you explain that it's with her heart. I fucking hate you. I want you to die. That was, um, and the child called it and I re-examined that and returned to the river. I called that the cobra scene. And it kind of laid that out quickly. You know, I, I really was naive i thought you know again if i do all my chores on time or or maybe when she chokes me she'll see that i'm dying and my mommy would magically wake up from her her her, her coma and one time i got this letter from my teacher and he said you're not in trouble david this is a good letter your mom's gonna love it and my mom read it saying oh we like david in our classroom he's a good student he named a school paper we like david and my mom She's like right by bending down my ear and she says, aren't you precious? Aren't you special? And that's when she said, I wish for it to die. There is nothing you can say or do. And she took the letter and ripped it up. And I thought, again, if I can somehow piece this letter together, you know, and I have to tell you afterwards, I did the chores and I hated Friday because that means no school, no food. And she would have me sit outside on these rocks and these planes were taken off overhead. We lived right by the airport. And I thought, God, I wish I can fly away. I wish I was real. I wish I belonged. And it's not about physical pain. I mean, we can get over that. Mothers who give birth within a matter of minutes are holding their babies crying with joy, even though their body's been stretched out. Oh my goodness. It's always the psychological effects. And I felt terrible. I mean, and, and that's why I think my self-esteem wasn't really big in foster care. I knew on the inside I was strong, but I allowed myself to get bullied. I, 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 I just really believed that I was this horrible person. But you, through time and maturity, you know, you got to let that go. And, and it's taken me a few years to do that. I, I know in my heart, Alexander, that I'm a good man. And I want to be a good man and I want to be a better man and I want to be of service. And it takes a while to get used to it. Like, okay, my mom was just sick. That's all I can say. That's it. And that's all. She had no childhood. She was abused. She was raised. Again, keep your trap shut. This never happened. And every day when I was a kid, my grandmother would just berate, 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 berate saying the same things. You're a worthless daughter. Why don't you listen to me? You were never satisfied. So I can understand the cancer of abuse. So I can try to find a cure and prevent more cancer abuse per se. It was a very sad situation, but the thing we need to discuss here is the power of forgiveness. Mm. If I do not forgive my mom, I become the Terminator. I become nice. a Darth Vader. 
leader. Mm-hmm. I become I become the terrorist, mm-hmm. you know. And we've all had our hearts broken, whether it's a divorce, a love mm-hmm. affair that didn't work out, mm-hmm. maybe something happened to ourselves as children. But I think we have to just, you know, get it out of our system. It's amazing. We go to the bathroom, okay, and it's disgusting. It's waste. It's toxic waste. And we got air fresheners. We wash our hands. And we never think about that shit again, even though there's going to be more shit tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. You flush it away. And you just move forward when you're alive. Again, right. it just kills me when folks say, oh, I was abused 30 years ago and I'm so miserable. I'm going, well, I'm sorry. Get good therapy, work the program, and it's your choice. Again, for me, every day, I'm happy, 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 happy. I mean, I I, I had a, a Hollywood guy tell me, and he's, he's a very well-known person. He said, you know what, Pelzer? You're James Bond meets Jack Bauer from 24. And I said, shit, I'm, I'm Mr. Magoo when I'm off duty, but thank you, sir. <laughs> it's, it's all these little things that add up to your happiness. Lots of little things. And I can tell just by looking at you, you're a proud man, you're a strong man, and you're a happy man. And the fact that you're doing the number one show in your country and in Europe, for God's sakes, that tells you you're on the right track. Because right now, we don't need clowns. We need serious people to try to assist ourselves on this pathway called life. And we need simple information. And that's what I think you and I are trying to do. And if, and if you're going to give an advice to all the 20s, what would you say to them? In their 20s, uh, grow up. <laughs> Work is hard. I had a firefighter leave shift because he said work is too hard. I'm like, what? What? You don't know hard work. This is nothing. If you're in your 20s, I always tell them for the next 30 years, hunker down. Work every day. Save your money. Be smart. Think ahead because you're going to take a nap and you wake up and you're going to be 50, 55, 60. Uh, if you're over 40, 45, I say eat all the haagen ice cream you want. Mix in the slim fast. It all works out in the end. So it's about different maturity and physical part of your life about the journey. I can kind of coast a little bit because I'm in my 60s now. I'm going, well, I can eat an extra hamburger. I'll do an extra push-up tomorrow. It's always tomorrow, of course, never today. <laughs> but it, when you, if you're a young person, you just dig, 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 and keep on trucking. Don't. The one thing that makes me mad is when people give up on themselves. If you have a certain dream, I say try for it. Go for it. At least, you know, know that you tried. Mm-hmm. You know, I want people to succeed and I want them to be very happy. It just kills me when they say, okay, work is hard. I'm checking out. Like, really? You're going to live in your mom's basement for the next 30 years and she's in her 80s. I don't think this is going to work out for you. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes it's good to struggle. When we're little babies, we fall down on our face. We fall down on our butt. But eventually we learn how to walk, how to run, and you're off to the races. It's the same thing psychologically. If I have succeeded in one thing, I have probably failed it a million times. When I was a fire captain, I would say, don't pull a Pelzer. This evolution, do not do this, 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 and this. Why? Because I did it and I screwed up. Don't screw up like I do. Learn Mm -hmm. from my lesson. Just as a parent, you're always teaching. You don't want them to have the same mistakes and pitfalls that you had. We know as parents, we can't protect our kids from everything. And sometimes it's good for them to fall. Let them get up by themselves. So there's always a valuable life lesson. You just have to give yourself permission to go through it. And you have been very successful by yourself, but also you have met a lot of successful people. Um, yep. And and, and I, I, I think that you have thought about this a lot of hours, that what, what is the difference? What is the difference who do the difference? I think, again, you've got to be persistent and you have to want it more. Because I would I see people every day, they want something and they want it right now. I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is, this is huge. You're not going to, at age 20 with no money, buy a house. Okay? You have to save up. You've got to be persistent. You know, so again, it's all those little things. And there was a guy, and and you might have heard of him. His name is Arnold 
Schwarzenegger. He has a thing on Netflix uh, uh, called Arnold, and it's three separate chapters. It talks about him being a bodybuilder, and then talks about being an actor, and then talks about you know when he became governor. And on the third episode, after he talks about being a governor, he kind of pauses. And he says, "You know what? Here's a lesson: none of us are self-made." I'm thinking, really, for him to say that. He said, "I was brought over to America. I was." sponsored uh they gave me a crappy room above the gym and then i met this person who got me there and this person did this 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 i'm going oh my god and the fact that he admitted it mm. and was very emotional about it and grateful i'm going good that's a great lesson because a lot yeah. of people they look at my bio and say oh my god dave you walk on water i'm going i can barely swim okay <laughs> but if because yeah. because of the right people at the right time you know, I'll never forget. Um, I met my teacher, Mr. Ziegler, when I was writing the book and we went out to dinner. And I told him one time I was very emotional. I said, sir, uh, I was having a bad day. And, and you put your hand on my shoulder and said, you're doing a good job. And I said, sir, I just absorbed it like a sponge. And when things got really bad, I would go back to that and I would use that and draw from it. And he said, you know what, Pelzer? I don't remember doing that. And I looked at Mr. Ziegler straight in the eye and I said, but I do. It's always the small things that you appreciate the most. Sunrise, sunset, waterfall, popcorn, uh, uh, a beer. See, people, you know, I, I, I think it, maybe it's a generational thing. Again, they want so much so fast and they need to slow down and appreciate what we have. Again, COVID taught us to be humble. COVID, mm -hmm. we, we've all lost someone from COVID, for goodness sakes. And maybe you getting smacked around and me getting smacked around can tell the story not about our abuse, mm -hmm. but about our journey of resilience. I got something for you here. All, all right, right, cool. Let me see if I can find it. I, I think, is that it right there? Hang on a second here. Yeah, my fingers are not working well today. I'm a, I love movies, and you, yeah. you've read about that. I love, I love my James Bond. I like uh, the Mission Impossible. I love, I love a good it's love great. story. It's great. And uh, there, there is a movie called No Time to Die with our good friend Daniel Craig. Mm. And uh, at the very end of the film, James Bond's boss M reads this, and and this is so important for you. And for your listeners, the proper function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. And that's by a, a local writer named Jack London from Oakland, California, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. A lot of people exist. They're the walking mm -hmm. dead. Right. You know, they're living they're right. living in their past mm. and they're, they're so self-medicated with drugs, alcohol, or their own toxic selves, their own mm. toxic choices. Mm. Me, I'm an adventure guy. Mm. It sounds it doesn't sound macho. My biggest thing is I love to cook. I'm a cookaholic, okay? Mm. Especially mm. with the fire department. You're always cooking. You're always cooking. And I love to plant flowers inside and outside. And yes, I'm waiting for my next James Bond film. Oh my God, one of these days it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even doing your show. I got to tell you, I've been up since 1.30 my time. <laughs> and I, have, I was on your computer. I'm going, oh my God, I don't think I got the right link because we were, <laughs> God damn it. I, I, I don't want to miss this opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then look at what you're doing now. You're smiling so much. Beautiful mm. smile. And I'm smiling with you. And that's just the unexpected excitement of life. Mm. You know, you don't plan it. You just let it happen. Mm. Just do, there's, this, there's a prayer. I'm not sure if it's Baptist prayer. And this is another beautiful thing for your audience. Do as much as you can for as long as you can for as many as you can. Mm. And that's that great. is a very as much as beautiful prayer. As Again, as don't can. don't live, simply exist. Go out there and do something. 
something. If you're having a bad day, please get an extra hamburger. And, and, and I bet you, if you feed it to a homeless person, they'll cry. She says, Oh my God, I exist. I'm not broken all the way. I matter. And that was one thing my mother took away from me, you know, that I did not exist, that I didn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I know I matter now because now I'm a grandfather. My, mm -hmm. my, my grandson's four years old and I saw him a few days ago. I said, listen, let's get into some trouble. Okay. Cause I'm just going to blame everything on you. Mm. <laughs> you got to have a good laugh again, yeah, yeah. live a grad adventure to tell a good story. And you've got a good story. My story is okay. It's okay. And it's not about abuse. It's about the wonderment of life. Sometimes when I do shows, uh, uh, when I first started doing them, I would see people bringing napkins and tissue paper. They said, oh, Dave's going to make me fun. <laughs> and I thought, no, we're going to have fun. And I would just do these Dave Letterman, Robin Williams jokes, you yeah, know, because yeah, I'm yeah. trying to say if I'm relaxed yeah, yeah. and I'm okay, I know you're going to be okay. Nice. And that's what I try to convey. You try to convey that. I like to do three nice things a day, make people laugh, do three good deeds a day. And some, I like to do three good day, deeds a day for myself. Three, you know, can, you, can you take that again? That's a good routine. Can you three good again? deeds a day for other people. I like to make people laugh three times a day. And I try to do three nice things for myself. A cup of coffee, a glass of wine, planting flowers, or just sitting and just mm. watching the world. Mm -hmm. so i try to have a balance because as you know i'm very intense i used to i mean i used to, one time i think i ran a six minute mile when i was young oh my goodness i used to do a lot of just action adventure stuff but i'm at the age right now it's like yeah i like sitting here and just doing nothing i think i'll read a book <laughs> or I'll, nice. I'll watch that new television show <laughs> that's nice i must ask, ask you about something, something. Uh, and that's the that's i read that you uh that that, that you have received personal commendations from four U.S. presidents. Yeah. Tell me about yeah. that. I, I, oh, gosh, I don't know. You know, it's weird because when you meet when you meet someone like, you know, a president, because there's a lot of briefings, like uh, when POTUS, we call POTUS, president of the United States. When POTUS says this, don't say anything. If POTUS asks you a question, just say yes or no, and that's it. That's all. And uh, I, I, I remember. Um, you are not that type of guy. guy. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm in etiquette and protocol, you know. Um, but I remember when I met President Reagan. Uh, uh, he was in his office in Los Angeles after he was president, and 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 he showed me his office because he used to be my governor when I was a boy in the basement, and and I used to hear some of his radio shows. I thought, wow, what a commanding voice he has! What a commanding presence! And uh, I have to tell you. Um, I'm kind of a weird, awkward guy. <laughs> he put his arm around me after he showed me his office and he said, do me. And I'm like, Mr. President, what? <laughs> he says, oh, do me, do me now. I'm like, what the heck? And I was <laughs> flustered. And he says, I heard you can do my imitation. Do my, my voice. And I got so <laughs> nervous. I couldn't, oh my, I couldn't. Oh my gosh! I said, Mister President, I'm sorry, Mister. I can't do your voice right now. Said, can you do President Bush, Senior? I said, Yes, sir. I think I can. And he said, Okay. How about this? I do Reagan. You do Bush. <laughs> so we we kind of just and we I made him laugh, which was really nice. That's amazing. But for me, it's it's it, <laughs> you are this boy in the basement, you know. Yeah. Or I got a, I got a golf lesson. My first golf lesson from Mr. Clint Eastwood, for God's sakes. He, him and his wife had read the book, and I was doing volunteer work in the area, and he had a youth center that I helped out. And, and, and you know, uh, I don't have any – I've I've been with Mr. Schwarzenegger because he says, you're the guy that does my voice. I'm going, that's correct, <laughs> Arnold. I do your voice fantastic, all right? Get out, all right? Let's get to the chopper. <laughs> <laughs> I only have one celebrity photo. Because all my photos, and I'm in my office right now, my son, my grandson, my teachers who rescued me, uh, uh, my time in foster care with people that helped me. Mm -hmm. I, those are my celebrity photos. But the only mm -hmm. one that I have, and I just took it a few weeks ago, was with Mr. Eastwood. And uh, mm -hmm. he recognized me and he asked me over to sit down and talk to him for a second. And he doesn't take photos. 
because everybody goes crazy. But he says, you want to get a photo there, boy? I'm going, yes, sir, Mr. Eastwood. I will certainly like that very much. And he gave me the Grand Torino. So I'm shaking the guy's hand, and he gives me the Grand Torino fingers, which is badass. <laughs> but it's, it's when you – it's not about meeting – to say you met with this person, but I'm always curious, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, I met this lady who was very pregnant and we talked about our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I can see uh, because I love movies and how they're made. I, I've, 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 I can talk to different actors, not about, oh, my God, you're so and so. But about when you did this one scene, what were you thinking? What was going through your head? I'm always what I call a psychological voyeur. I like to know how people think good and mm -hmm. how they think not so nice. But, you know, it, it's kind of it's it's it, it looks good on the bio, you know, like, oh, Dave has been, you know, lauded by four presidents. I mean, it's kind of cool. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm eating a macaroni salad that's three days old. OK, it's not that sexy or exciting. Like I said, the guy said, Dude, you're James Bond. I'm going, I'm so Mr. Magoo. OK, trust me. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna say that I have like many questions, but but um, I, I was wondering, uh, what do you think about the world? What do you think about like the common 10, 20 years? What the common 30 years? Is this that something you have thought about? That because there's a lot of shit going on right now. The Russia and Ukraine, yeah. the US, oh, the China. Uh, I, I think I, I think we're in the middle of a very bad James Bond film. I think Rasputin is is Blofeld. And I think uh, Mr. Trump is kind of like an evil henchman because it, so much is happening so fast. And my country has changed so quickly hmm. in a matter of uh, not even eight, 10 years. And it used to be that you can talk politics with your family. Now you can't say anything because you might set someone off. Or if someone doesn't agree with your political sense, oh, my God, I mean, they, they want to shoot you. If you don't agree with this, you should be shot. I'm going, no, no, no. So it has changed quite a bit. But I also think as an optimist that if it's up right now, things will kind of settle and go back down. I hope so. It's kind of like COVID. I mean, it was a wildland fire. And then we slowly, slowly, slowly got control mm -hmm. of it as best as we could. I just see so much rhetoric. And when I was a kid, when you saw the town mayor, you waved. When you saw a police officer, you saluted. Mm. Uh, you never said the N word to a teacher. You never said the word no. You weren't disrespectful. And and it's part of it is my generation. The older I get, I'm going, where's everybody's manners? Why is everybody getting so jacked up on nothing? I call that white noise. And I feel bad for my son, you know, and even my grandson, because they're going to have to endure some of this madness. But at the same time, too, someone like Putin, he's not going to be around forever. He can't. And my president right now is sitting in New York City being indicted for fraud. My own president. Oh, my God. What? I'm so ashamed and embarrassed. But at the same time, I have to keep my side of the street clean. Mm -hmm. he, he's got his issues, his problem. That's theirs. They own it. All I can do is be a good person. I can lead by example as a good fire captain. I can lead by example for to be a good parent or grandparent. I just have to work on my side of the street. But my country has changed an awful, awful lot. And I think, too, part of it is the economy. We really don't have that much of a middle class anymore. You know, it's there's there's a lot of one percenters that have like 80 percent of the money and so forth. I. You know, there's there's so much going on. But again, all I can do is just work on myself. You know, I want to be happy. I want to be optimistic. But it is pretty interesting. It's almost like it's it's a new evolution of mm -hmm. thinking. I, I all, There was a line uh, when I was a child called truth, justice in the American way. Superman. And years later, a few years ago, they made a movie about Superman. And they said, truth, justice, and all that other stuff. In my mm. country a few years ago, pardon me for swearing, we weren't allowed to say Merry Christmas. Oh my goodness, how crazy is that? We were supposed to say, um, have a nice, pleasant holiday. Bullshit. Yeah. I'm going to say Merry Christmas. Yeah. And yeah. yes, I'm going to open up a door for a lady. 
and I'm going to nod at an older gentleman. I'm going to live my life the way I see fit. I want to be a gentleman's gentleman. In my country, that means you're a person of service, a person of high service. And, and some people say, oh, Dave, you're too damn polite. I'm going, yeah, unless you're an asshole. And then that goes out the door immediately. Hmm. And if I make people mad by saying, sir, or ma'am, or miss, that's your problem. Get out. Because I remember one time I was almost booed off stage. I was in Seattle and I said the L word. I said the word ladies. One young person of the non male gender sprung up like a rocket and cried and screamed and swore wow. and says, I'm no lady. I'm no lady. I'm no fucking lady. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that's evidence. But what was really was horrifying is how all these other women were hugging her like, oh, calm down. Does anybody have a napkin? Does someone get me a shot of brandy? I'm going, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> and Alexander, I felt terrible that I made this person so upset. But I'm going, stop. I'm just being polite. Yeah. And for a while, I kind of backed off. But I'm going, you know what? I'm an old man, no hair, no country. Guess what? If that pisses you off, good luck with that. Good luck with that. And that's, again, their side of the street. So I've seen a lot of changes, but I'm also seeing uh, some things coming back like manners, small manners are kind of coming back in my country. And if that can work, maybe other things can work. Because I remember when I was with Kenneth at Schwarzenegger and we spent the day together or a couple hours together. And at the end of the day, you get the cigar photo, you know, like you have a cigar and you, you know, mm -hmm. your buddy, buddy. And, uh, I was taking a photo with him, and I think I had my arm around him, and I said, sir, always remember, now you work for us. And I couldn't believe I said it. And his staff was like, oh, my God. And I'm going, yeah, I stick with that. As a firefighter, I'm here to protect and to serve. As, as, as a parent, I'm a leader. As a grandparent, I'm an old statesman. I'm here to lead by example. And yes, my country, I mean, I mean, I'm a little embarrassed, especially when I go overseas. Hey, are you from America? What about this? I'm going, I don't know anything about that, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I deliberately, uh, I remember when the, Mr. Trump was in the office, I would always turn on the TV and saying, are we at war with anybody? It was, just, it was, it was almost this too much. And a lot of people, what they do, too, it's like when 9-11 happened, they would constantly see the, 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 the towers fall and fall yeah. and fall. Yeah. And I said, you know what? Shut it down. Shut down the TV. When you get news, get a sit rep, a situation report. You don't need to watch television for eight hours on bad no, news. No, no, no. OK. No. And again, I agree with some of the things that Trump did. A lot of things I'm going, what did he just say? Oh, my gosh. I mean, but he, he actually uh, put a lot of comedian writers out of uh they made him unemployed because you couldn't make that crap up. I mean, it was like, oh, my God, what did he just do? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? How about this? Why don't you put him on the show and he comes over to your country, okay? Then he loses his passport and he has to stay in your house. <laughs> <laughs> I hear he likes a lot of burgers. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, it's, it is it is it's just sad because when you think about the office of the president, you know, and every president, Richard Nixon said, you write your best memoirs in jail because there's nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. And then you think it's like being a parent because I was talking to my son a few days ago. I said, well, when I did this, I probably should have done that. But at the time, this was my thought process. Mm -hmm. And again, the office of the president, it's just so overwhelming. It's like being a single mom, the 57 million kids. You're not going to please everybody. And people want to be pleased. They want that one five second answer, you know, whether it's about abortion or women's rights or, you know, medical care. They want it in a simple solution. And life is not simple. Life is loud and life is messy. Again, as much as you can, as long as you can, for as many as you can. Mm -hmm. When I taught new firefighters, like uh, it's called structured defense. So let's say there's a building that's on fire. And it's a thousand steps and they get overwhelmed. I said, slow down, put on your boots. That's three seconds. Put on your trousers. That's five seconds. Put on your jacket. Three seconds. Get in the cab. One second. Do it in small increments. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like a slow, it looks fast, but it's a slow ballet. And mm -hmm. you practice, practice, practice. 
practice and you're going to fall down and make mistakes. And then we debrief. Okay, who screwed up? My hand is up first because I screwed up more than you guys did. Let's learn from our mistakes so we can be better. But again, it's always thinking about being of service. See, a lot of people forget that dynamic. That's the first thing is be of service to yourself, to your family, to your community, your country, and the world at large. Mm -hmm. When I do uh, my opening podcast show, I always say, uh, this is Dave Pelzer speaking to you in my own voice, saving America and the world at large from itself, starting with me. So it's a little, it's a little quip that I kind of like people like, what do you mean he's speaking in his own voice? Of course he is. You're you're missing the point, Jethro. (laughs) (laughs) And if you want to listen to your podcast, I'll put put the link here. What's the name of it? It's uh, the the Dave Pelzer show. Dave Pelzer show. And what do you get from it? I can't listen to (laughs) nothing. (laughs) Your, your voice. Oh, what what were you going to, what are you going to get from it? What we're doing right now. We're just talking back. Uh, there's, I'm, I, of course, it's a, it's a rambling monologue. But what I like about it is it's very topical. And you think the show's going to be about this. Then I kind of just, you know, go all over the place. And then we right. wrap it up nicely. Like uh, I, 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 the last show we did, it was really beautiful. I talked about, you know, I'm slowing down. I'm driving slower. I'm smelling the roses. And you know what? The little things. When I was a kid we went to this place called the Russian river and there was a slow left-hand turn and my brothers were asleep. I said, and yet I saw thousands and thousands of redwood trees. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the basement, when I was down, I would think of that and I would dream about that. And now as as an old man, I live at the Russian river. And Mm -hmm. every time I see that slow, slow turn. And then I ended the show by saying, okay, now it's your turn. Hence, you know, take those quiet moments. What made you happy as a kid should really make you happy now as an adult, you know, and particularly at my age now that, I mean, I've, I've seen the world. I've had a lot of Mission Impossibles, a lot of James Bond assignments. I've done some cool things. I've been privileged to meet amazing, amazing people. The press, you know, uh, I don't have the president's photo here. I don't. It's in a frame somewhere in a box. Hmm. I have photos of my son and I having a cigar or my little grandson holding my hand or when my son was very, very young and he's still laughing and, you know, it's not so serious. Mm -hmm. Those magical moments that are everyday moments Mm -hmm. and you have to grab them. You've got to grab them. And that's what you would get out of it. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, if if you want to get in contact with you, is that possible? You can listen to your podcast. Is it something else? You can read your books. You have nine books. I also put the link to the books here. That's very kind of you. And I like, uh, I will say this as a writer, I think um, my first book was very lucky and it was very engaging because as a writer, I think about movies. How do I, what's the opening act, the body and how do you close it out? And if you look at a child called it, it was really written by an eight-year-old boy. That's why it's very graphic and very visual and fast moving. And the last book, uh, Return to the River, it was almost like a nod to Christopher Nolan, that movie director. He's fantastic. He did Oppenheimer and the Batman series. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different threads in Return to the River because it talks about that family dynamic, what happened to the family, and then bounces back between me being a firefighter and going through an unexpected loss and then another unexpected loss in the middle of this world, uh, world, the world pandemic. And it's really a beautiful love story. And I'm very... Out of all the writings, I think that's my favorite book, The Return to the River. Yeah, it's an amazing book. And I put the link here, too. That's very kind of you, sir. And and like, uh, thank you very much, Dave, for for visiting the podcast. And it has been amazing to talk to you. And I also love your books and, uh, yeah, what you communicate and also your well, voice. <laughs> I, I have to say I have to say this, and, and I don't say this a lot, but thank you for your work. You're a young man. You've done a lot. You've served your country. You're now serving the world with your show. And I it's my honor. One, let's do this again. We'll do jokes next time, okay? Yeah, I'll come yeah, on yeah. As, we must do it. We'll, we we'll come on it. as Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and then we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll do Clint Eastwood. We'll do goddamn Gran Torino. Yeah, we must you do know. it. We must do it. You little punk-ass boy, you frog boy. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Get the hell off my lawn. And then, uh, yeah, But I want to thank you for, for the yeah. work that you do. And it's my privilege. And I, I wish you and your family the very best. And I want your audience, there's your takeaway. 
is one, be kind to yourself, forgive yourself, and please, of all things, be happy and be happy now. Damn it. <laughs> Thank you, Dave Pelser. God bless you.